Thanks, that was very nice, Jane. Um, I'm going to start with a really short, super short video. Uh, this is from 2011. This is the same site that, um, that was on the film called Martin's Ground, but we call it the Cauliflower Garden for obvious reasons. You can see the white frilled anemone there. There's a lot of them there and they look like heads of cauliflower. I didn't actually name it. Uh, one of our other divers that was out with us. This is a real difficult site to dive because the current rips across the bottom, but makes for great marine life. So, wicked shore. Um, do I just hit play here? Most of my videos are really super fun. This is one of my serious ones because I know you guys are serious. <laughs> There's still a ton of places in the bay I'm trying to explore. Uh, uh, I have a lot of limitations what I can do because of the, the bay is really super deep and my training only brings me down to about 150 feet. Of this winter one of my plans was to try to do some more uh, mixed gas diving and I got all the equipment to be able to make it all but I don't quite have the training under my belt yet to be able to do that but my goal is to get to about 300 feet which is uh, you know, the bay, of course, is a little bit deeper than that, but uh, so I can figure out what's going on down there, just because that's the way I am. Now, a lot of you already know I went to COA, and when I was there, I studied uh, marine ecology. I built an underwater nature trail. I did uh, group studies on um, research and technical diving and things like that, and I work with a lot of students at the college doing uh, different diving projects, research projects, and stuff. And actually, a lot of the stuff that everyone's talking about doing, getting some baseline data for, um, for being able to quantify changes over time is the stuff that I was trying to get CRA students to do. Back when I was a student there, it was more like, oh, I'm gonna make this beautiful underwater nature trail so people can see all the cool sea creatures and stuff like that, of course. Um, since then, the, the college didn't have a dock, and of course, that, that, that goes right over the trail. I actually had to drill the blasting holes to be able to get the pier in there and stuff. But, um, uh, and I got hired right away when I graduated from COA because of that project to work for the Smithsonian as a marine ecologist. At the time, the Smithsonian had just tried to make Frenchman Bay uh, um, a conservation site. They were going to allow fishing, the guy that I worked for, Walter Adie at the Marine Systems Lab, they were going to allow fishing, everything basically to stay, stay the same, but they wanted to be able to uh, use it as a monitoring place, because uh, Walter had recognized Frenchman Bay as the most important bay in all the coast of Maine as far as getting a lot of the animals from down east that live there, a lot of animals from the western that live there, and um, so for me, of course, at that time, I already knew it was an awesome bay. And so he proceeded to ship me down to the Everglades to go start collecting animals for the Biosphere Project. But anyway, I moved back after I was done with that. Jane asked me to talk about uh, different changes that I've seen over time underwater. And a lot of stuff, of course, I've been diving here since 1984, uh, commercially, uh, mostly. Well, not mostly, nowadays, not as much as the old days, but I used to harvest uh, scallops, sea urchins in the early days of urchins, and uh, welts, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, and uh, I started doing some filming and educational stuff, and, um, and on top of regular commercial diving work. So I've seen a lot of the bay that's within diving depths. But, uh, 
Anyhow, one of the things I wanted to mention was uh, Baldrock, it's interesting that there's no dogfish on the initial site, uh, this initial study that Proctor did, or on the most recent one, and I knew that was going to happen anyhow. But that used to be the place where the bio lab used to get their dogfish yes. all the time from, which is kind of, there's obviously something missing in the middle there. The, uh, in the old days, in the 80s, when I was uh, diving, working up the Skillens River and places like that, I mean, dogfish were everywhere. Every dog we would see dogfish. We'd see cod, uh, flounder, hake, everything. I mean, there was tons of fish around, but even then, there was still nowhere near as many fish as the real old days. Um, so, I'm just going to start with the fish thing, which is kind of backwards for me. Usually, I start with starfish and go up, but uh, um, now, just like we see on those videos, we hardly ever see any fish. On the dive-in theater, the number one question we get on the boat is, Where's all the fish? You know, people don't realize it because lots of times they're seeing so many other interesting things that, and I'm kind of forcing them to see what's right in front of them. But the reality is there's just not any fish anymore. And what we call trash fish like sculpins, sea ravens, and things like that, even though the populations of those have been dwindling quite a bit over time. The thought originally was, you know, once we get rid of the cod and uh, haul a bit and... Uh, uh, hate big hate and stuff that maybe some of those big fish populations would come back but uh, and they did for a little while but I think a lot of it is like lobster and we use them for bait and uh, and they get caught in the traps a lot too so there's just not as much trash fish around either so now I'm gonna go back to starfish <laughs> uh, so it I always said on the diving theater which I started in the year 2000 um, I always said that the one animal we're guaranteed to see, the only animal I guarantee you on the, on the diving theater is a starfish, period. Because I always dive someplace different, I never really know what to expect, and, um, but there's starfish everywhere. In the last uh, two or three years, I don't even say that anymore, because the starfish have been um, bunching up and moving into deeper water throughout the summer. And, a lot of people ask me to explain why. Lots of I have my own speculations, but I have no real understanding why. The um, not this past summer, but the summer before, I had a month of every dive over 80 feet on the dive in theater to find starfish. I had to go to 80 feet deep in Frenchman Bay on every dive just to get to the starfish. We also um, uh, have seen. The, our blood stars, are, are, we have these beautiful blood stars, and most of them are blood red color, especially the ones that are feeding on uh, the fig sponges, which get really huge. Um, but there's all kinds of other sponges around, too, that they feed on, and depending on uh, what, and they also eat uh, um, hydroids and stuff like that, too, but depending on what they're eating, depends on their coloration. And we had a few years on the dive-in theater, and I actually, brought a group from the bio lab to, on a diving theater, to a site where I knew I was going to find these beautiful blood stars. The way for like three years where blood stars were humongous like this, giant, and they were beautiful colors, fluorescent, uh, oranges and yellows and purple stuff that you just can't, you, it's not something you could ever paint or anything, the most beautiful animals. And actually if you look at our uh, brochure we have some of those real pretty blood stars, my art guy kind of cut them out on the computer or something and shoved them on there. But uh, they're absolutely amazing. And then all of a sudden, bang, nothing. So uh, we started to find some more small blood stars here and there. And, um, uh, and what, one thing that's happened is we realized at the same time, I just actually was realizing, the sponges have gone. So uh, a lot of places where they get towed, they get dragged, especially scallop drags or cucumber boats. The big, a lot of the big sponges will go away. Fig sponges up, uh, live out, uh, they'll attach to the smallest little thing on the bottom. A little teeny rock like that would be a huge sponge attached to it. So it's barely negative in the water. And they live out in the mud where, you know, they can move around and stuff. And uh, 
when that gets towed, those get dis those disappear real fast. But they grow really fast too. A lot of the bottom where it's been towed, and then when Frenchman Bay was closed for scalloping, those sponges came right back. Huge, giant blood sp uh, um, uh, fig sponges came back. But we lost uh, in the upper part of the bay. We've lost all of our finger sponge and chalice sponge, which was everywhere. I mean, I wish I. Uh, we're building a house this winter. All my stuff stowed, all my videos are in fish trays stowed in my shop. But I wish I could show you the stuff from the old days. I mean, I used to put my little Claymore Mill diver in the chalice sponges and you'd just sit in there and there were always like toe crabs with finger sponge all over and stuff. It was really cool. And um, then we just realized we're, you know, lost all of our sponges too. The, there's no sun stars left in Upper Frenchman Bay as far as I can tell. Uh, there was a picture of me in the um, uh, Bangor Daily with a big fluorescent orange one on my head. And um, that was the last one I saw. That was, uh, and we used to traditionally on the breakwater, where there's millions of sea cucumbers where they can feed on the cukes there and the, uh, um, and the scarlet solar sea cucumbers, we'd find tons of these big, beautiful blood stars. They're all gone, all up above the porcupines and stuff like that. And that, that includes the spiny, the red ones that you saw in the video, and the orange and purple ones. Those are two different species. Both of those aren't there anymore at all. Zero. We never see them, not even a chance of finding one. Um, we still see some out in Egg Rock and then, like you saw, out in the outer part of Frenchman Bay out there. Um, cucumbers varies. Like on the breakwater, there's tons of cucumbers still. That can't get towed, obviously, because there's a big wall of rocks. And that's really an amazing sight. I mean, literally almost every piece of hard bottom is covered with cucumbers there. Out on the flat bottom where the uh, cucumber boats have been working, um, the, they just keep towing back and forth over and over. And it's not just that stuff, the barring anemones and everything else. In the old days when the scallop draggers came through, the bar anemones would pull down, they'd take off the top layer of sediment, and the bar anemones would come back up through. Um, but now because even though those aren't heavy dredges, they keep, the cucumbers are barely negative, they're full of water. So they're pretty much, uh, they barely stick to the bottom. So when they hit them with the drag, lots of them just kind of float up, and then they can keep going back over the same piece of bottom and still catching cucumbers. So they tow back and forth over and over there. Um, we have plenty of toad crabs still, which you saw on there, the ones that decorate themselves all the time. This past, was it this year or last, two years ago, we found a common toad crab. We usually, uh, which we've never, we had never seen before in Frenchman Bay. And then we found another one and another one. Last year we found, started finding more and more and more. So that's one thing that's really uh, seems to be plenty of. Green crabs, of course, we already saw in there. There's tons of green crabs. And a lot of the green crabs are starting to work further subtitally, getting into deeper water, too. Um, lobsters, of course, you know, is the, is the one thing that's very odd for us. Uh, we have watched the lobster population just grow and grow and grow. And at this point, it's in, it's, it feels like a disease on the bottom, which sounds really bad because, of course, lobsters are really important here. Uh, but when everything else is gone, you can't help but wonder what's happening with the whole ecosystem. We watch the, lobster, the lobsters go from being able to see them pretty much on every dive, hanging out underneath a rock during the daytime, to like pushing them away to film other stuff. They're out during the daytime which they always used to be nocturnal. They're out in there during the day. They're not scavenging, they're killing. They're eating starfish, they're eating cucumbers. They're ripping things apart all the time. There's just not enough food for them, probably, I'm guessing. And, uh, but we're, we film lobsters eating stuff on the bottom, which is really cool. It makes for unbelievable footage on our boat. We have an 80 inch LED TV, so it's really cool. I zoom right in, you can watch them this stuff apart. So that's really fun. Um, uh, sh uh, relative to the lobsters, the shrimp, uh, we, what was it, s maybe seven or eight years ago, we started to run into this big giant shrimp. I brought one up on the boat. It was 
huge with a big saddle on the back called a sculptured shrimp. I brought it up and I wouldn't let any of the passengers hold it. I was afraid, it looked like a mantis shrimp, I was afraid it might like, you know, rip somebody's skin or something like that, you know, or uh, break a fingernail. Come to find out they're super sweet, I can put them, kiss them and put them on my tongue or, and everyone, anyone can hold them, but they're huge. And now we see them all the time from, it is an Arctic species and it came, you know, from none and never finding them at all to all of a sudden bingo, there was just tons of them around. So there you go, some things that disappear and some are coming. We talked about the anemones, frilled anemones used to be on every dive. We don't hardly see any more of those. There is a big push to collect our frilled anemones. The uh, operation down east, down in Perry, that uh, supplies the biological companies. Uh, we've got divers down here, and they're harvesting uh, anemones for biological supply. They've, they've caught, grabbed the ones from up there. Uh, New England Aquarium typically strips Eastport as much as they can, uh, keep collecting and collecting. So a lot of the dive sites that we go to down there disappear, but now it's starting to affect us as they <coughs> clean up Eastport, uh, we're the next best place to go. So uh, we've lost a lot of our, and they just don't, we, for some reason, they're not coming back. A lot of it is the bottom, the competition for the bottom is getting taken over by these uh, sea vases, these, these tunicates that are, uh, uh, that you've probably heard in the sound, people keep thinking they're getting egg cases attached to the traps or something, but they're actually a tunicate, they're a clear tunicate. And a lot of the places where the anemones would be coming up is just literally there is an uh, uh, inch of space on a rock or a ledge for them to go. That said, the other tunicates, sea peaches, which seemed to be disappearing for a while, has started last year. We started seeing quite a few sea peaches around, which was really cool. And they're bright orange, so they're real fun to look at too. Um, uh, the invasive tunicates, of course, are showing up everywhere. And lots of times they're, in a, they're encrusting. Uh, let me see. So we already talked about fish. The jellies is a hard one because uh, you know, a lot of the stuff with the jellies is really cyclical or uh, depends on, you know, currents and things like that. Um, there was two summers in a row in Frenchman Bay that I could, our crew could not handle any equipment without gloves on every day. Every dive, I would come up covered in lion's mane tentacles. Every dive. And you'd be filming underwater, you're coming up through, it would be on the bottom, uh, stuff, you know, even the anemones would be eating the tentacles and stuff like that. Every now and then we'll see, especially in the fall, we might see a big one come through or something like that. Um, even the comb jellies come and go. We had one year where we had leatherbacks in the, in the bay because we had so many comb jellies and stuff. Um, I have no idea why. Flounder though, going back to fish, I forgot to tell you, the flounder have definitely come back. A lot of little baby winter flounder around everywhere. I mean, there's bazillions of little flounder around. Those are every dive now we pretty much see, or almost every dive, depending on the bottom, we uh, see tons of flounder. Uh, sea urchins on the north side of the islands, which is uh, the flat mud, muddish bottom. The north side, we used to have a lot of small urchins that lived in there, and then for the last, uh, say, 12 years or 15 years, haven't been any. Last year, there were tons of little baby sea urchins on the north side of the islands. South side, where the big rock faces are and stuff, where the urchin divers work a lot of the time, those have been pretty much cleaned out. Uh, every now and then, you run into patches, like other around egg rock and stuff, you can find some big patches of big, beautiful urchins and stuff things like that, but that's mostly in the deeper water just because of the, the algae that they eat make them so that they're not, uh, make it so that the roe is not tasty so people don't work into the deeper water for the urchins that can't get any money for them. Um, also, there's, you know, we were, I was talking to somebody here about uh, the species um, identification or program where you can uh, log in and report different species and where you found it and stuff. One of the things that happens is <clears throat> every day we see something odd. And odd meaning we might know what it is or 
but odd like we didn't expect to run into it or why is there just one type of thing? Um, and so when you find one, uh, one animal, say like a goat shrimp, right? You find one. I found one in my whole life in Frenchman Bay. You can't help but wonder where the rest of them are. Because it can't just be one shrimp. It's not like it came in on the, this is a bottom dwelling, burrows in the mud and stuff. It couldn't have just come in with the, it's not like finding a trigger fish or a seahorse or something like that, odd like that. I mean, we're talking about stuff that should eat a rat tail, sea cucumbers, a lot of weird things like that. You might find one of, like once a year or every couple of years, or you might see, you know, one type of thing. So, um, you know, one of the things I'm hoping about working in the deep water is maybe run into some of that stuff. Maybe just one's living, most everything else lives deeper than where I can go or whatever too. Also, uh, the, you know, we've been talking about um, cleaning up the bottom with uh, the, the lobster traps. A lot of people are worried about all the ghost traps down there. Um, and I'm not exactly, I know that uh, recently they've discovered that the traps are leaching PVC into the water. I don't know exactly what that means for the whole ecosystem or whatnot, but I can tell you right now, as far as habitat is concerned, lobster traps, ghost traps are incredible habitat. So when you look at general marine life, if you think of a ghost trap, oh, it might catch a lobster or something like that. Uh, it would have to be a pretty big lobster not to go through the vent after it opens up, number one. So sometimes that happens. Sometimes a fish might get stuck in a lobster trap. Um, but the reality is, old ghost traps are amazing, amazing habitats underwater. And, um, and so I don't know if there's a, originally when the state, before they what wanted anyone to know about the PVC thing, I offered to let us collect them, and we would make these artificial reefs out of them and stuff, because it was really cool. But, uh, of course, they wanted to drag them up instead of dive them up. <laughs> okay, one last thing I just want to say is, this is the, the bio lab is right across from Guggen's Ledge. And Guggen's Ledge, to me, is one of the most special places in all of Frenchman Bay. That, when Frenchman Bay was closed to scalloping, and before that, there was years of no scallops at all. We had 15 years of zero scallop settlement in this bay. And uh, the first year that it happened, there were little, just millions of little baby scallops swimming around everywhere. And they settled up on there. And unfortunately, that meant that it's been towed since then. Uh, we worked up in there diving for scallops when it was open this last go around. Uh, few years back now and then um, uh, one of the drivers had seen us up there and uh, literally the next day 11 boats were on top of us and they flattened it out but that place came back like you would not believe. Uh, the, there's a worm, a sea mouse, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but uh, uh, this really unbelievable uh, bristle worm, it has iridescent bristles. I hadn't seen one in probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, and it was one of the things I used to study when I was a student at the college. I had a big lab set up in the basement of the tourist building, and I used to have sea mice in one of my tanks, and they'd have a dozen sea mice in there. And I mostly studied them just because I thought they looked cool. I wasn't really paying attention. I was like, wow, my sea mice are awesome. But uh, anyhow, the, up at Goobin's Ledge, and you know, my first dive I did up there, uh, after we, we could start scalloping up there, there were sea mice on every dive. Sponges had come back huge. Giant hermit crabs everywhere. And it was just, it was anemones. It was the most amazing thing. I felt like I was in bottom, that, like virgin territory that no one had ever been to. Unfortunately, that's gone again now. But, uh, Frenchman Bay is now closed for scallop and has been for a couple of years. I think it's next year it opens back up again. But, uh, you know, one of my goals is before the draggers come in, I want to go back up there and film up there just because it's an amazing place. But something to think about where, you know, that's right here. I mean, you guys can take your skiff right over there in two seconds and use that as a study site. Um, but anyhow, and I've been working with some of the students at the college to try to make a part of the guzzle 
in uh, between Bar Island and the college, a little study site too. But um, but unfortunately, that gets towed pretty hard by the cucumber boats in there. But anyhow, thank, thank you. Yeah. So much. Anyone has any questions? Okay. Can I do it now? Yeah, let's, right. have, let's have questions now because uh, Ed can't stay for uh, after the um, after the break. So if you've got some questions, this is a this is go ahead. Uh, have you ever witnessed uh, green crabs uh, attacking baby lobsters? And do you see anything at all? Because you go out and walk around the mud flats, you're going to see a uh, small flounder. You can over the last 30 years. But never see any bigger ones. Do you see any bigger ones at all? Very, very few. Every now and then, you know. And actually, for the bio lab, I uh, I had to collect some baby flounder. And back then, all you know, the only place I knew where to get a lot of baby flounder was right underneath the town floats at at the Bar Harbor Town Pier. Town Pier. And I used to, I had just a slurp gun where you suck them up, and um, I used to collect baby flounder like that. And um, but now they're a lot of places, a lot of flat bottom, they're everywhere, but how many, we only see one or two big ones a year, and yeah, and that's the thing, you know, a lot of people want me to try to explain what's going on, and I don't really, you know, I spent so much time on the bottom now that I've decided that everything I can think of is just, a, is probably wrong, because it's, it's always different, I never know what to expect, but, uh, um, who knows where the little ones are coming? Just like the scallops, holy moly, the whole, the whole coast of Maine, just out of the blue, we came from not having any scallops, or just being packed full, and not all traditional bottom either. Uh, as far as the green crabs, I haven't seen them attacking baby lobsters, but that said, you know, little baby lobsters are literally way underneath the rocks and stuff, and so it would have to be a super by chance thing. I mean, I see a lot of odd by chance things like that, but I've never seen that. But I'm sure if they're small enough, you know, anything will eat them. Thank you. Yeah. Who does your hair? God. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? So real quick, during your really interesting talk, I thought I heard you say that one of the species that's really coming back well was an Arctic species. Yeah, that, yeah, I know. It's so opposite of what we think. Yeah, just, water's getting warmer, and we're going to call. I, I don't. I have no idea why, but yes, it's, it's called a sculptured shrimp, okay. and we see more and more every year. And I'm not complaining. It's one of my favorite, most favorite animals in the whole wide world. Uh, I can handle them. They're really fun to be around. They're great. You know, your kids can kiss them and stuff. You don't have to worry about. Them. I'm getting their lips split open or anything. And... So Ed, um, our video work over the last couple of years, sort of, we see everything south of the porcupines as being sort of diverse, looks healthier. The upper bay has more sediment. We're not seeing diversity. It sounds like you're seeing the same thing. Yeah. But there's sort of a dividing line around Bar Harbor and the porcupines. Definitely. The, the... You know, a lot of it is the habitat is a lot different too. I mean, uh, you, you just don't have on the, that's what I mean, one of the reasons Frenchman Bay is so special is because we have the porcupines are an amazing place and those big, and, and ironbound and egg rock and places like that, you get those big giant vertical walls and giant boulders and stuff, there's a, there's a lot of place there for stuff to attach to and on top of that, that's not, you know, where scallop boats or cucumber boats, anyone can actually work. You know, in the old days, uh, as far as fishing, you could, and you'll still see that's where they're gonna, even the deep sea fishing boats, that's where they're gonna bring people to go fishing, isn't around, typically, unless it's blowing a gale, you know, uh, they'll, they'll try to get to the other side of the islands. And we have seen, and I didn't mention it too, but we've been seeing more cod, you know, on, uh, we probably the first eight years of the dive-in theater from 2000 to 2008, I might have seen one or two caught. And this now we've started to see more and more. Um, you know, we dive all typically all winter. This winter I'm building a house, but uh, and uh, and lots of times like if we're out at Egg Rock, uh, 
we were on a night dive at Egg Rock on the uh, west side of Egg Rock, and there were tons of baby cod there. Um, some other places, one of the places that was identified in Ted Ames study was uh, over uh, off of, this is in Franklin Bay, but off of um, uh, Newberry Neck in, uh, uh, in Blue Hill Bay. And we did a trip for, this, for the residents of Surrey, and we went off the tip there, and there was giant finger sponges there, and there were little baby cod all in those finger sponges there. And that was one of the places Ted Ames had identified too. And so it's, you know, I feel like, well, I don't, it doesn't feel like the cod will ever come back as like a commercial fishery, like mass scale like we're used to, but I feel like the fish are coming back. And that, you know, that, there's a bright side to a lot of, a lot of this negative thing with there, you know, bad things happening with uh, depletion of stuff, but the, the, I think, if a place is given enough time, it can easily come back. I mean, this bay, there's so much water. There's a reason why the Levesque have their, their muscle float up the bay there uh, off of Le Moyne. And so, I mean, that is, a, that is a productive area. Like I said, if you take a big flat mud bottom and you swim along or put an ROV down there, you're going to see limited species or whatever. You throw anything in there, a rock, a ghost trap, Anything that something can attach to that, that the marine life there will blow your mind. I mean, it's just uh, it, it it can happen. Is is this place is an incredible bay to be in, and that's not even talking about like you know we were somebody mentioned anemone cave or whatever. Holy crap, you're going there. That's really mind boggling in there too. I got some incredible video. That's a whole other place that should never get touched by anything. But uh, anyhow, any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I lived on uh, Skillings River, Kilkenny Cove area. Oh, yeah. And there's something being towed up through there. Are they cucumbering or what are they doing? Yeah, probably. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know. Are they edible? Are they using medicines? What is he? Both. Is yeah, it's both. They use them for food in Asia, and they also use them to make uh, arthritis medicine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, so. that's an area that does upset me because there's some big kelp beds in there, and they go oh. right through them, and it takes all the kelp out. Yeah, that laminate, that place is amazing up there, the kelp. And and, uh, and as you're going up the Skillins River, there's a, you know, I've kind of ride the tide through there, which is really hard because it really rips, and you crash into rocks. It's, it's quite dangerous, but it's really exhilarating. And uh, <laughs> But it, where you ride the tide as you go up through the uh, Skillins River, that if you could stop, if you could catch it at slack enough tide to do some video work in there, you'd be amazed. Even up uh, Taunton Bay, I had to do some. I did some work for the friends of Taunton Bay, filming up in there, and uh, and they they picked three places they wanted me to film, and uh, I couldn't believe like uh, there were these big horse muscle beds and just like I never seen so many um, uh, brittle star arms sticking through there and. Uh, big healthy starfish and it was it's really cool the habitats we have here different uh habitats are just amazing and and uh you know in out in the deeper water just from lobster and shrimping and stuff like that i i already know the stuff that i never get to see that i know is there and uh you know even like the fish i've only caught every three monkfish on our on the diving theater and uh and I know that there's monkfish around and, and ocean pout and uh, wolffish and, you know, and even, even the sharks, you know, we, it's not just dogfish, but, you know, we used to have a lot more blue, we used to be able to walk, follow blue sharks around in the bay and stuff like that. I used to try to get in the water with them, of course, they just swim away, but, uh, you know, now we haven't seen a blue shark in ages in the bay. But, anyone else? Yeah, I've been reading about some uh, wasting disease in starfish. In terms On the of west coast? Well, yeah. no, in New England. Uh, yeah. Rock, is it, do you see any uh, signs of that? Yeah. It turns their uh, appendages to jelly. Yeah, we, we, we definitely see that. There's uh, <coughs> We always feel like there's different species of common, the like common northern sea star, only because uh, what happens is sometimes you bring them up and they're all soft and gooey. And sometimes they're hard and firm, you know. And, um, and we evaluate, of course, each individual starfish to decide for our touch tank and stuff which ones 
Because the last thing you want that every little kid to pick up a starfish, hold it, because we encourage everyone to hold everything flat, and, but for an arm just to fall off, which is what happens uh, a lot of times with those soft ones, they just start dropping arms. And you see it on the bottom. You'll see an arm crawling around all by itself. And, uh, and you, sometimes you can see all five arms from one starfish where they just split apart into a big, like, mush. And... Uh, but maybe I'll give all those lobsters something to eat. <laughs> well, thank you. So much. All right.